Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's webinar from Professional Beauty and Hairdressers Journal Ireland. And apologies, we're a few minutes late, but we had some technical difficulties. Um, so this week we have uh, Brian Mullins is back with us. Brian Mullins from Brian Mullins Insurance. Um, welcome, Brian. Nice to see you again. Hi, Karina. How are you? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we had a, la the last time you were here, we had a really good reaction to the webinar. There was lots of questions and people very interested in, in all uh, the stuff around insurance. So we're, we're kind of going to pick up where we left off and we're also going to look at the topic of public liability. So um, you said you wanted to sort of start with a brief update from where we left off and, you know, giving some insight into uh, what you found when businesses reopened. Um, do you want to talk me through, you had said about um, level of activity, are salons reopened or are some of them still waiting on phase four, which is something I hadn't really thought of actually. I thought everybody was yeah. reopened. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, hello everybody. So uh, thanks again for inviting us, Karina. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to talk. Um, the last time we spoke was in the middle of lockdown. Uh, yeah. which is strange and all as it is, um, and it's still strange times. Um, in our office, we are partially open, so we have uh, three teams working remotely and one team in, in the office at any one time. Um, so I, I think that's been replicated within a lot of businesses out there. Um, so we're seeing some re-engagement, um, certainly the larger salons or salons with employees, uh, be it in the hair sector or the beauty sector, we find that they're the ones who have re-engaged first uh, and are reopening. Um, we get the impression that the sole traders uh, or those who may have been operating from home, um, they're holding off um, and seeing how things go. Uh, and they're not as keen to open. Um, maybe it's because they weren't doing it on a full-time basis and they were uh, they're in a position to hold off. Um, but that, that's the kind of, we, we are seeing a lot of engagement. Our phones certainly from the end of June uh, and emails ha have been crazy busy. Um, and we are trying to re-engage with as many customers as we possibly can um, in as timely manner as we possibly can too. But uh, yeah, it, it, there's plenty of activity. Uh, there's a lot of confidence, a lot of questions, uh, which is to be expected, but it, it, it's been good. And the, when you said there are lots of questions, um, now I know we're going to touch on public liability later because you had said to me previously that that's probably one of the most commonly asked ones, but are there any other questions that are popping up over and over again? Yeah, I suppose um, with regards to the reopening, when we spoke the last time, it was all about planning to reopen uh, and we hadn't reopened. Um, now that business is back on, um, we're getting questions about PPE, do we have to wear PPE? Is it a requirement of the insurance? We're getting asked, uh, is COVID covered? Uh, what happens if somebody gets COVID? So if, if we can take the PPE one first. Um, so there's no directions coming from the insurance companies uh, as to what businesses should do or what therapists should do. The direction is really coming from government or from NEFIT uh, as to how we should be conducting ourselves and regarding the social distancing and regarding PPE and screens and uh, and we have to take direction from them. It's not coming from the insurance companies um, and they will be slow to do that. It's not their area of expertise. So uh, we're not going to get uh, a directive coming down from the insurance company saying that uh, all therapists or technicians uh, must do A, B, C mm -hmm. in order to be covered. That's, that's not the case. Um, is that actually like does you know kind of a gray area come up there and i suppose we're seeing that across a lot of industries where like you hear it coming up over and over again at the moment that like industries aren't being given clear directives from the government so it's kind of like you know the way they're saying schools now um like nobody's sort of saying who has to wear a mask and who doesn't have to wear a mask so are the insurance companies, they can't, you know, make the rules either because the government hasn't actually said 
if you're a hairdresser, you're legally bound to be in a mask and a visor and whatever. Is that problematic or not problematic, but is it kind of, does it cause confusion with salon owners? Yeah, certainly. I think there was an element of confusion at the start. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's kind of confusion. I'm slow to use the word panic, but it was almost like we were all caught in the headlamps. And you said, oh, we're, we're allowed to reopen early. What do we need to do? Uh, uh, and it all became a bit of a frenzy uh, as to how to get up and running as quickly as possible, whilst trying to be doing it as safely as possible. Um, but I think a couple of weeks on, we've kind of got used to it. We're, we're, we're settling in. Um, PPE masks, uh, thankfully, are becoming more the norm. Uh, we're seeing an awful lot more people wearing them. Um, an acceptance of the steps and procedures that you must do um, are being put in place by the public and then by businesses. Um, but I think it's, it was almost an impossible task for the government to come down with a directive for every type of business. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do believe that in the UK they did go through a, a number of steps regarding face-to-face um, -face businesses so anybody doing facials any like uh, dentists beauticians yeah aesthetics anything like that and uh, they certainly had a directive uh, much more of a directive than what we appear to have got here um but uh, i think ultimately it's going to come down to the, the common sense approach um of the business owner and of the therapists involved that you know we're really only going to do something that we feel safe doing for ourselves and, and for our customers uh, and once yeah. we have that as our guiding principle, I, I think we're going to be on the right course. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think um, our masks are um, going to become, I know we were talking there before we, we went live about the 10th. And um, I think that from the 10th, you have to wear them here in shops and theatres, cinemas. So I'm guessing salons get included in that now as well. Yeah. Well, that's it. Uh, like we, as an insurance broker, we also have a, a shop front here within uh, Sligo. Um, but the, you know, are we within that uh, guidance? Are we a shop? Yes, we probably could be. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, the, our experience here now uh, is that people come to us without masks. Uh, we have uh, masks available at the front door. We have hand sanitizers. We have umpteen signs, as you would expect from an insurance broker to have. Um, yet people just, uh, it's almost like a, a dodging course. They, they navigate their way through the signs, through the hand sanitizers, without hitting any of them. Uh, and yeah. they the front counter and go, hello. You know? So it's, um, no matter how much you put in front of them, uh, you still have to uh, remind the customer, um, you know, would you mind please wearing a mask? Would you mind please using the hand sanitizer? And I think that's important going forward. But uh, I think it's going to be here for a while. Yeah, I think we'll get, uh, I think we're definitely getting used to it, but we're still not 100% there yet. I mean, I find myself even, you know, I forget when I go into a shop that I'm supposed to put a mask on and it becomes exhausting putting it on and taking it off. And you're not meant to do that anyway, so. Yeah, sure, yeah for sure. Uh, I, yeah. I think we've all probably uh, stepped into the shop and suddenly went, oh, you know. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah uh, but it. I think because it is going to be here for a while, I think it is going to become the norm. And we, we yeah, will. We'll, we'll get more and more used to it. So, um, shall we move on to the topic that we have uh, chosen of public liability? Yeah, so, public liability um, seems to cause a, a lot of confusion. Um, uh, we get a lot of questions from salons, from business owners coming to us and saying, well, I don't need liability insurance because the landlord is covering it. Or, or what do I need liability insurance for? I, I have my treatment risk covered. Uh, and it's really just as, uh, to try and give some background or, or some guidance as to what is public liability insurance? What is it meant to cover? Uh, uh, and why business should, should have it in place? Uh, I suppose the real life examples would be that when we read in the papers or we hear on the radio, um, about uh, an award being made in court uh, for personal injury. And uh, we hear these astronomical figures of 50,000 mm. for the slight, what we would consider maybe is only a minor uh, occurrence, um, up to millions for severe occurrences. They're all awards made under a public liability insurance or what should be covered under your public liability insurance. So uh, public liability to be defined is uh, 
it's def defending a claim for negligence that has been made against you for personal injuries. So a third party, uh, potentially a customer in most of our cases, uh, has alleged that they were injured or their property was damaged as a result of our actions. Uh, and it's the defense of that claim for negligence that is the case that's covered by your public liability insurance. So it's not about right or wrong. It's not about whether you've taken all the steps. It's defending the case or defending a claim for negligence that has been motioned against you. So you open the, uh, we've all come across cases where we see uh, a solicitor's letter arrives in the door uh, and that is the first that the salon or, or the technician or the professional knows about the case or about a claim being made against them. And that is quite often the case. So it's, it's the defense of that action, that legal action that has been taken. So once that solicitor's letter has been issued and has been received, the, the motion is in process. So you then have to defend that. So it is going to court un, unless it is um, settled or the claim is dismissed before it goes to court. But the process has started and it needs to continue and you have to be there to defend it. And that, that's why um, liability insurance is so important. And so the insurance company takes over the defense of that claim on your behalf. Okay, and then as a hair or a beauty professional, you know, salon owner, um, why do you need it? Um, well, really, it's the, 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 the potential cost of a liability claim being made against you is so enormous that that really is, if you were uninsured, uh, I would imagine that even the slightest liability claim would really uh, potentially close any business. Um, when it goes to court, uh, because of the Personal Injuries Bureau as well, um, we would see that the minimum cost of a claim getting to court is going to be 25,000 plus. That, that's the minimum cost. Um, now, cases can be settled outside of court before that uh, or for lower amounts. But if it goes to court, the minimum, because of solicitor's fees, barrister's fees, legal fees, will be 25,000 plus. So if you potentially have a claim for 25,000 plus being made against your business, can that be sustained? Uh, and that's the question. That's why you need public liability insurance. Uh, it's for no other reason. It's not whether you think you do everything right and you've taken every step. It still doesn't negate that a claim can be made against you. And it's the defense of that claim that will cost. So that, that's really why, why you need it. And can you give examples of scenarios in a hair or beauty business where it would come up? I'm sure, I'm sure there's lots. Yeah, there is. Uh, um, yeah, you, you, we get a lot of notifications and we, there, there are claims, obviously. Um, the claims are changing. Um, so we, we see a lot of claims for burns. We see a lot of claims for scalds. Um, for uh, regarding the laser, uh, it would be burns and marks, um, discoloration. Uh, we would see um, some claims for dry needling, um, which could be very large um, and very costly claims, uh, right down to the slip, trips and falls that you would see in any business. Yeah. But, uh, really, uh, allergic reactions um, uh, and burns would probably be the, 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 the number one uh, rise or cause of claims that we would see coming across um, and they go from you know temporary kind of redness and swelling um, and discomfort uh, right through to um, scarring uh, uh, and depending on where on the body um, uh, and the level of discomfort the level of scarring the age um, all of these things can have a factor on uh, the potential cost of a claim okay and you know the way you were saying this you know, you've been getting a lot of questions. It's sort of one of the number one questions that you get asked about. Is that since COVID? Do you think that COVID has caused people to become more aware of it? Or is it just something that people don't understand and they, they ask about anyway? I wouldn't say that people don't understand it. It's not that they don't understand it. It's just that it is confusing. Um, uh, and. Uh, because of the term liability insurance is not in daily use um, and there's so many different ways it can apply as to whether you're the owner of the property, whether you're 
um, the tenant, whether you're actually providing the treatment. Each one of those carries their own liability insurance and each one should be covered separately. Um, so uh, understandably, a tenant or a business can say, well, no, there is liability insurance in place. Uh, I saw it on the lease or I saw it on some document. Okay. But that might be there to protect the landlord. It might be there to protect your business or it might be there to protect treatments. So uh, that can be the confusing part. Um, so it's to drill into it and to see, uh, is my activity, is my business covered for liability insurance? Uh, and that's what you need to make sure. Um, the COVID question, uh, certainly we got a lot of uh, requests to say, is, is COVID covered? If somebody says they caught COVID on my property, yeah, covered. Um, and COVID uh, as a disease, as a pandemic, is not covered under any insurance policy um, because it's going to be very hard to show negligence against a business for somebody catching COVID within your property. To be able to, to specifically say, I caught mm. it in that salon on that day, um, it's going to be very difficult. And because it's a pandemic uh, and so widespread and it's, uh, uh, the virus is so easily spread, is a business actually negligent if it comes into their business? So the, the, the thinking so far is that the business will not be found negligent. It will be just put down a, a, a cause of the, or a result of the pandemic and therefore no claims for negligence against the business will succeed. So in that regard, it's not insurable because of it being a pandemic, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just thinking back there to when we chatted before and we were talking about, you know, COVID being included in insurance policies and how it wasn't in them because we never heard of COVID before. <laughs> Whereas now it's like, you know, we're wondering if somebody going to get sued. Yeah, I, I, it is. There's no, yeah, they, I mean, it, it still uh, Karina, won't stop a claim being made against uh, a business. So when I say it's not covered, so the potential uh, claim for COVID being caught on a business premises, the, no award is going to be made underneath the public liability policy. But uh, the defence of the claim uh, will be covered uh, or should very well be covered by your insurance policy. So if the solicitor's letter comes in and says, uh, I contracted COVID uh, within your premises and I hold you personally responsible, yeah. then that should be passed on to your insurance company immediately. Uh, and they will respond accordingly. Uh, so the defence of the claim uh, may still be covered rather than the award of a claim because uh, we can't, or the industry uh, can't see how an award for negligence can be made against a specific business for... Yeah. And I suppose with, with businesses now, um, you know, part of their defence, that's probably the wrong word now, but it's like, to be able to show that like you did everything you were supposed to do anyway so you know all the protocols with the return to work uh safely stuff you know the way you have to have um your covid statement and your covid what is it the covid act not the action plan but um yeah, response yeah. plan response plan and then you have your lead representative in the in the salon or the business yeah, we, yeah. We, we, all of the, all claims are claims for negligence so yeah. somebody has to, or the third party has to show negligence on your part or is trying to show a claim for negligence on your part or your business's part. So once you've taken every step, no more than providing a treatment, once you've taken all of the correct steps that you can yeah. or expected to do, it's going to be very hard for a claim for negligence to succeed against you. And again, it goes down to the, the common sense. Once we keep trying to remembering to keep ourselves safe, our customers safe and our employees safe, I think we're all going to be on the right path. Yeah. And then um, what are the risks involved if you don't have public liability insurance now? I'm assuming that the main risk really is financial. Oh, it is. It, it's financial. It's, it's it really, that's, that's the only risk. Um, in Ireland, um, public liability insurance is not compulsory. So it's at the um, business's own um, request uh, to get it. And um, so uh, in the UK, they have employer's liability insurance is compulsory, but uh, public liability insurance isn't compulsory there. So that, that's the other thing. If a salon or a business has employees, you know, it's crucial or very important that you also have employer's liability insurance in place because um, any injuries or damage to your employees' properties 
um, will not be covered under a public liability policy because by definition they're not a member of the public they are your employee so they need to be covered under an employer's liability policy um, but yeah i mean really the only risk to a business is financial uh, and how large that financial loss or the potential loss would be is down to the the whim of the court yeah and when you say that in ireland it's not um compulsory um like in your experience is, is it something that is it something that most salons are you know they take it out anyway or is it seem to be a sort of a luxury of an add-on that a lot of people don't bother with yeah. i think i think when businesses are starting out it, yeah. it's one of those costs that uh, the intention is there to take it out uh, and I'll get to it, you know, uh, when I get a minute. Uh, getting stock in or get, getting advertising done or getting something else can often take precedent over uh, insurance in certain circumstances, certainly not all. Um, but as salons grow or as business takes off, um, th there seems to be a kind of a tipping point when the turnover reaches a certain amount or where the, the business is, is fully engaged. You can say, oh, I'm now busy. Um, perhaps I should start taking out some insurance or I should start thinking of insurance. Uh, so we would find that it doesn't happen day one, but somewhere along the road, um, they kind of catch their breath and say, now is the time, uh, I should probably take out some insurance. And once it's in place, we find that um, a lot of businesses will maintain it and it becomes uh, part and parcel of being in business. Um, certainly, uh, any larger salon or business uh, will have uh, insurance in place. Uh, and um, it, it's just one of the necessary costs uh, for all businesses, it's not just within the beauty and the hair industry, it, it goes across everywhere. Um, and uh, no more than was saying the last day, it, it's just so important to make sure that you, you talk to your broker, uh, talk to your insurance company, uh, and make sure that they have a clear understanding of what you do and you have a clear understanding of what's covered. Um, so uh, that it's not just uh, tick a box, I have it, um, but don't pay any attention to it. You know, it, it, it needs. Just spend a bit of time on it, um, get it right, uh, and then once it's in place, it's there to provide you uh, with the safety net that your business needs going forward. Yeah, because I suppose, as you said, when somebody's starting up, and even now when people are, are worried about their businesses, um, there's a tendency to kind of, you know, mi you know, cut out costs that you think you don't need. So I'm assuming that something like that would be one of the first things you'd be like, oh, I don't need that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. The great, the greatest example I saw or experienced there when the in, during the last recession um, was the uh, spring water containers uh, that were everywhere, uh, the water coolers, um, and suddenly uh, they became a luxury, uh, and a lot of businesses just said, "Right, uh, <laughs> we have to cut some costs," and, and the water cooler went. Yeah, um, get back to the tap. I don't, know, I don't know how many had gone back in, but the, the, they were one of the, certainly one of the luxury items that left, um, and insurance. Would have, would have, um, in some cases, I'm sure, uh, been let go uh, with the intention of taking it up again. But sometimes, the the time span can can grow, and uh, before it's re-engaged, um, it, it should be noted that uh, in times of recession, um, liability claims go up. The the number of claims registered, um, okay, is, uh, dramatically uh, during times of recession. Okay. So you know that uh, an injured party um, you'd have to take that all claims are genuine we'd go on that basis like also an injured yeah. party you know uh, they're financially finding it difficult at the moment uh, and it may um, and not encourage but uh, they follow up on an injury claim then at the time of recession you know um, yeah. and look for their due compensation so um but certainly, uh, the, the number of claims registered uh, in a recession, there's a dramatic increase. Okay, that's an interesting uh, statistic. And is it more, um, just in terms of the cost involved in it, is it, is it very expensive or is it, you know, sort of a, a needed oh, expense? Oh, no, certainly not. I, I mean, you can get policies, depending on the, the level of the size of the business, you can get policies covering public liability and treatment risk and from um, from for salons and businesses from 250 euro up, depending on, on yeah. how much stock or contents or, or therapists you have or your level of activities or, or what treatment you're providing. 
if you're a sole practitioner doing holistic treatments only, um, those premiums can be from as little as 100 euro up. Um, so no, it's, it's relative to the size of the business, but in relation to a business's turnover, it certainly wouldn't be a, a large cost uh, in comparison to the turnover. Yeah, but it can be an overhead um, to every business, but I, I, there's, there's very few policies that would exceed um, the cost of a minimum claim in court of 25,000. Yeah. Uh, nearly all policies will be well below the 25,000 limit. So. Okay. And you sort of half answered there. My, my next question, where I was going to say, is it more important than ever now to have public liability insurance in a post-COVID environment? Now, you kind of answered that in the sense that, like, our post-COVID environment is probably going to be a recession. <laughs> So, as you said, claims go up in a recession. Well, claim, claims go up um, in a recession, yeah. Um, so bear in mind that the, the, in most cases, uh, an individual or a third party has up to two years to register a claim. So what we could be experiencing now, the upsurge in claims uh, over the next six months, um, more than likely will be events that have already happened. Um, and um, they're the kind of the claims that we're going to see coming through. Okay. Um, but it doesn't stop that, uh, or uh, it certainly business, should, if you don't have insurance in place at the minute, you know, each day that goes past, you are running a, 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 a greater risk uh, in a time of recession by not having insurance. Um, but uh, we, we would expect to see uh, a surge in claims, but. Uh, as I said, that there probably would be claims for events that have already happened um, within the last yeah. two years. But do you think that people now, salon owners, are are their their heads more focused now on areas like insurance in the climate that we're now in? Because I mean, I know that salons were already focused on hygiene and health and safety uh, more so even than other businesses, but because of the way we've all gone now with you know, the paranoia and the fear and just the, you know, the constant sanitizing the hands and everything. Do you, do you, have you been finding that, that your, your own clients are more focused than ever on making sure that their insurance is, is locked down um, properly? Personally speaking, for our business, I have to say that we would find that the, the, the beauty and the hair industry as a whole uh, are extremely professional in how they approach um, insurance. Uh, I think it goes down to the level of training that they have uh, undertaken to get their own business up and running, mm -hmm. and that they're well used to ticking the boxes and getting qualifications. They are professional. Um, as a sector, uh, we find it an excellent sector to deal with. And we find even when it comes to claims at the very upfront, um, it's you know, how can you assist me? Uh, 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 and we very much work together uh, with the clients. Um, so yeah, they, they, they have a really healthy respect and approach to insurance. Um, whereas in other sectors, uh, we would find that they would be an awful lot more relaxed. But um, no, I'm very happy to say that the, 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 the hair and beauty industry, um, and it is a testament to the amount of training and qualifications that they do undergo uh, and continuously undergoing. Um, that uh, I think there's, there's not a client that we have that isn't continuously developing uh, uh, and taking on new treatments and new training uh, and constantly learning and progressing. Uh, and I think with, with that background, uh, it, it encourages uh, the, the, the professionalism and encourages then their engagement with us or with, I, with any insurance provider, not just us. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's a great sector. And then just finally, um, you know, overall, now that salons have reopened, or the majority of them have reopened, um, will insurance needs change or will they sort of stay the same and adapt? Or do you see anything coming forward down the line? Um, yeah, there, there's a couple of things I suppose to watch out for. Um, I know I alluded to the last days, just uh, probably earlier on too, was just to, uh, uh, put out your policy if it wasn't if it hasn't fallen due since yeah. the 4th of March and you haven't looked at it since 
um, pull it out, have a quick look at it and make sure it's up to date, that you, your therapists and your treatments and, uh, that, and the business activities that you're providing are, are reflected on your policy schedule. I think um, now is the time then to look at your premises and your contents and your equipment to make sure that you're, you're fully protected by your insurance policy. Um, I, I think that going forward, um, we, we are all going to be changing. We are all going to be adapting. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a certain starting off. We may be taking slow steps or, or smaller steps and then the business will pick up and we take on new uh, therapists or we take on new treatments. It, it's just, uh, as we get busier, we may forget uh, to go back and address the insurance policy and make sure that that is also up to date. Uh, so that's what we would be saying is it just just make sure uh, as you reopen, as you're getting busier, uh, as you may be increasing your staff, uh, you're increasing your turnover, uh, just be mindful that it's being mirrored and reflected and covered that's underneath your insurance policy. Uh, and just, you know, get to know your insurance policy, get to know your insurance broker, engage with them. Uh, they're there for advice as well. No, we're, we're, one of the biggest things that um, myself and the team here would do is uh, we'll be talking to customers every single day and it's just business advice uh, as business owners to business owners. Um, uh, and under probably the guidance uh, of our legal uh, expenses insurers as well, and just to, just to say, listen, if there's anything we can do, we can talk you through it, you know. Um, and I think that's the way forward is just to engage. Uh, and uh, there's no question uh, is a silly question, you know. Uh, every question is valid. Yeah. And just to uh, drop us in, drop your your insurance broker or us an email or phone uh, and uh, yeah, I think everybody would be very happy to uh, offer any advice that we can going forward. Okay brilliant um, thank you so much for joining us again um, that was all very helpful um, I'm sure we'll have you back again in another while <laughs> when we move, we move on, on to the next phase we'll have more questions again so thank you um, again Brian Mullins for joining us and uh, thank you everybody for tuning in and we will be back again at the same time next week we're going to be talking to Kathy Wilcox, who is from DMK Ireland, and we will be talking about the do's and don'ts of online skin consultations, which, as we all know, have become quite popular now. Uh, so thank you again, and everyone have a lovely weekend. And thanks again, Brian, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.